I was paid off at the pool in the port of Liverpool at three pound ten a week. That was my pay. With a pocket full of tin, I was very soon taken in by a girl by the name of Maggie May. Oh, Maggie, Maggie May, they have taken her away. She'll never walk down my street anymore. That judgey, guilty bounder, the robin a home with bounder, the dirty robin, no good, Maggie May. Now the first time I saw Maggie, she took my breath away. She was cruising up and down in Canning Place. She had a figure so divine and a voice was so refined that me, being a sailor, I gave chase. Oh, Maggie, Maggie, May, they have taken her away. She'll never walk down my street anymore. That judgy guilty founder for robbing a home with founder. That dirty robbing no good, Maggie, May. In the morning, Good quality could I find And when I asked her where She said my very good sir They're down in Kelly's pawn shop number nine Oh Maggie, Maggie May They have taken her away She'll never walk down my street anymore That judgy guilty founder For robbing a home with founder That dirty bottle no good Maggie May Hello, welcome to episode three of Glass Onion on John Lennon. And the song you just heard there was a traditional Liverpool song about a lady of the night who used to work around Lime Street, which is the road which has Liverpool's main railway station. And the song's called Maggie May. Of course, Beatles fans will know that there's uh, about 40 seconds or so of that on um, the Let It Be album. And the Beatles undoubtedly played it a few times during the Get Back sessions. Uh, it was also played by the Quarrymen, possibly on the day that John met Paul, as depicted in the film Nowhere Boy. But uh, we don't know if he necessarily played it at the Walton Village Fate on the famous day. So anyway, the reason I'm playing that is that, as promised last week, I have an interview with one of the original Quarrymen, Rod Davis, who's actually a current Quarryman as well. That recording came from 2004. They put the band back together about 20 years ago. So I'm going to go to the interview with Rod very soon. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I had some feedback on my voice again. Apparently my voice is a bit too fast now. After being told it was uh, soothing after the first episode. So I think I'm just going to let it go where it goes and not worry about it too much. I also had a comment from a lady called uh, Teresita from uh, Tenerife here in Spain. Uh, known in English as Tenerife. And uh, she said in her wonderful non-native English, your podcast is very well. And uh, as an English teacher, I wouldn't have it any other way, Teresita, so thank you. Now, just one more thing before I go to the interview. Uh, about 15 minutes in, I think, 20 minutes, uh, Rod talks about um, being in the same house as John Lennon uh, at school. Now, I just wanted to explain that this is house, not as in somewhere you live. But uh, grammar schools in England, uh, grammar schools basically a school where you have to pass a test to get in, a high school, secondary school, were divided into houses. I'm never quite sure why, <laughs> to be honest. Probably a tradition that goes back very far. So uh, Rod talks about being in the same house as John Lennon, uh, not actually in the same class. But if you're in the same house, I think you shared some classes. And the houses are often had very flowery names. Or sometimes they were named after famous British Prime Ministers like Castle Ray or Disraeli. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to clear that up in case anyone was confused when they heard Rod talking about that. So anyway, let's go uh, straight to the interview with Rod Davis. This is part one. There will be another one next week, which means you'll hear another Quarryman song as well. And I'll be back very briefly at the end of this interview for a few words before I sign off.
So I'll see you on the other side. Uh, welcome to episode three of Glass Onion on John Lennon. And I'm very happy to have on the line one of the original quarrymen. It's not John Lennon, unfortunately. But I'm very happy to have uh, Rod Davis. Rod, how are you today? Oh, fine, thank you. I'll uh, do my best to uh, make up the fact that I'm not John Lennon. Oh, well, never mind. Or Paul McCartney, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope I haven't got you up too early, have I? 9.30 in England. This is, I've just about staggered up. All right, excellent. So we're going to go more or less chronologically through your life, and obviously we're going to focus a lot on the 50s era. But just before we start, actually, I'm going to ask you in general, how clear are your memories of that era? Actually, pretty good. I'm notorious for remembering things like from a long time ago. But don't ask me about what I did the day before yesterday. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Because it's a frightening amount of time ago now, isn't it? 60 years yeah, well, we're talking about. It is indeed, yeah. The problem, well, I wouldn't say the problem. We have you know, hacked over these memories quite a lot in the past with other interviews, obviously. So it's not often that something comes up that I haven't talked about before. I've tried not to polish them up too much and uh, yeah. refine them uh, because a lot of what we do is, is, is actually debunking myths about what what happened, you know, or yeah. what happened. Anyway, let's see how it goes. We? Yeah, well, I do, yeah, I do have a few myths that I would like you to debunk. So, um, yes. So, as Julie Andrews suggested, let's start at the very beginning. So, um, John Lennon was born in 1940. You are around the same age, are you? Uh, well, I was born November 41. Okay. Um, I was a bit of a swat at school, so I managed to jump a year, which is why I was in the same year as John. Right, right, because he's October 40, wasn't he? That's right. What would be your earliest memory? I mean, obviously the war ended in 45. Do you have any memories of that? The, either false memories or real ones are fine. Oh, I, I'm sure <laughs> one or two real ones. My dad worked for Tim Lyles, which was a sugar refiner's, and uh, as such, he was in a protected industry, and therefore they couldn't draft him. But he did work on the, not a home guard, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, an air raid warden for a time. I don't really remember that, but then after that, he worked on the rocket battalions. They were in Sefton Park. They were firing these rockets to frighten off the, the Germans. He said, mm. I'm sure he killed more, more English in Liverpool than we ever, ever did Germans. But right, I, I right. have a pink picture of him in his uniform either going to or coming back from. And uh, I was only talking to my, my granddaughters about this the other day because mm. I was visiting the fighter control headquarters for World War Two, which is about half a mile from my house here in Uxbridge. And I was saying, no, we had a, a metal table, and underneath the table was a mattress, and the idea was if there was a raid and you couldn't reach the shelter, you dived under the table, it was collapsed on you, then... Um, possibly protected by the table and I remember I banged my head numerous times on the on the edges of this table you know I don't have much more in the memories of, of um, actual war I remember after the war sometime during the war in Church Street in Liverpool hmm. there was a fire on exhibition or at least a, a single seater airplane and uh, that they were obviously trying to drum up you know funds and yeah. you could be put in the cockpit of the airplane and I was absolutely terrified. I wouldn't go in the aeroplane cockpit in case it took off. Yeah, so actually very little, really, of, of my very early childhood. I guess it was rationing as well. I think rationing was until the mid-50s, wasn't it? That's right, yeah, yeah rationing until the 50s. And mm. when it came off, an aunt of mine bought us a whole lot of Easter eggs. And I was, my brother and I were sick for a week. You know? Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Coming off Russian, yeah. Certainly. Yeah, and of course there's a lot of, uh, there's always nostalgia for those kind, those kind of eras. I mean, even though it's a wartime era. People always look back and think, oh, life was much simpler then. I think it was simpler. Whether it was uh, actually better in the grand scheme of things, I don't know. It's fine to judge that one. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, so so what are your earliest musical memories? What, what age did you f first start playing? Well, Roughly. <laughs> my mum and dad, for some reason, sent me to dancing class and I was doing tap and ballet in the same class as Rita Tushingham. Sheer coincidence that the class was the same class, but my mother and her mother had both been hockey players. So um, I was a, a lovely mover from a very early age. I think I must have been about three going to dancing class. And then when I was about six, I started going to piano lessons. A very old lady with a moustache. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we actually learned, learned to play the piano by gaslight. Uh, she had this gaslight. This was just down the road for St. Peter's Church, actually, in Church Road. 
I was playing things like flower waltzes and so on, all a bit mm. naff. Winnie Fred Atwell was around at the time, a Caribbean pianist. I wanted my mum to let me put uh, drawing pins in the hammers on the piano so I'd sound like a honky tonk, but of course that wasn't on. Eventually I shared the piano with my younger brother and we were doing duets. I think this was, I must have been about nine at the time. And he played the bass, I played the treble, and we, we had terrible arguments as to who played a bum note. And my mother eventually couldn't stand this, and so she sold the piano. <laughs> so that was my earliest uh, musical experiences. But I, I, I could play the harmonica by the time I was about six. At school, we had a craze for melody bones. I don't know if you've ever, or the clappers, you know the expression, going like the clap. Yeah. Clappers, a, a couple of cow's ribs that you held between your fingers, waggled your hand like this, and uh, they made a very, very rhythmic sound. And the, well, again, when I was about six or so, there was a huge craze for this at primary school. And, uh, I, I've um, occasionally astounded people with my ability to play the clappers. It's uh, you know the English version of castanets, basically. So then after that, we we had uh, primary school again. We were playing recorders. Mm. I seemed to be reasonably good at that. There were two, two of us in the class who really seemed to know what we were doing. And ultimately, mm. I'd rather fancy playing the clarinet, but the clarinets were too expensive. The fingering, of course, is exactly the same as a recorder. Yeah. But that never happened. But it was my... I wish I'd been a clarinet player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you'll know... Um, we'll get on to your banjo playing, guitar playing. But, of course, you know, you'll know that to play like guitar, you don't need to learn to read any notes. And of course, we we know that you know John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and I would say most of the rock pianists and guitarists they don't read music. So why do you think at schools there's always this obsession with learning notes? Because at my school, I, ne I never remember anyone saying, um, "Oh, why don't we learn some guitar chords and learn some songs?" There seems to be always this obsession with theory over practice. Any I, idea? I don't know why. It's always it's mm. always been a something which I, I've never liked. I mean, my Same own daughter. Here school she learned the flute and in fact she she became a grade eight flute player which is pretty good mm. and when she was 21 she asked for a saxophone so i said yeah you can have a saxophone as long as you promise me not to look at a note of music when you're playing it and she was silent and mm. of course music came before notes and i think it's much better to get people to as you say learn a few chords have a go mm. rather than be obsessed by reproducing somebody else's notes but you know, maybe some people can do it, some people can't. I've got very big ears, as you can see, <laughs> uh, on Skype. This there. is going to be audio only, I'm afraid, so we're, not, we're going to oh, miss no, that. No, yeah. I'm not frightened by flapping, by wiggling my ears, but right. I definitely think big ears go with languages and music. You know? Right, right. Simple physics. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely. But it's very worrying, Nick, the fact that they're not just encouraged to do it. That was mm. what was so wonderful about Skiffle, really, that, that you know, bands as far as we were concerned, were people in badly tailored, bad taste suits sitting on a bandstand behind a, a little music stand with uh, with sheet music on it, you know. Skiffle came along and you just had to do it, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Learn it and do it. It was totally different. Yeah, we'll get to that in a sec, don't worry. So um, I remember when I was at school, I won't go on too long a tangent about this because I've got so many things I want to ask you, but uh, I remember it was very difficult to even get to... A practice room at, at school it just always puzzled me it's like why is creativity not considered valuable you know it seems to be very very low down the hierarchy and worryingly it's going even lower down I mean I've heard stories about in in America because I I study America quite a lot even though I'm English because I feel like what's happening in America is so relevant to what's happening in the world and it, it seems like they're almost planning to eradicate it completely even over here in England, you know, the arts, arts subjects are under threat, at least from what I read. I don't know from my personal experience, but mm. you go, I used to, when I, I've been a teacher myself for a few years, and I used to mm. teach the kids the guitar occasionally in mm. lunch times, you know, and they would come to, come to me and say, oh, Mr. Davis, I haven't done my practice. I said, if you think of it as practice, you know, you're on the wrong foot. Yeah. Just pick it, enjoy it, you know, mm. practice it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now, I want to ask you about Liverpool in the 50s, just in a general way. Now, you, you did you grow up in Wilton? Is that right? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, my, I, was, I was born in Sefton General Hospital, which is, is mm. now an Asda. <laughs> it's probably the frozen food department. So you were born in Asda? 
in in one way. Yeah. yeah. Julian Lennon was born in that hospital as well. Ah, that right, right. Was claim to fame. Right. Yeah, Walton was a lovely little place. It was uh, it only became part of Liverpool in I think about 1913, something like that. Till then, it was Lancashire. And of course, Liverpool was Liverpool Lanx, not Liverpool Merseyside. Hmm. But Walton was definitely a village. We used to call it the village. I lived on the slope of the hill facing Lancashire. And so we had to walk up the hill to go to the village. And we used to say, I'm going up the village. And uh, maybe the people on the top of the hill used to say that we're going down the village. <laughs> now, the reason I was asking you, Walton is considered a... Would would have been one of the safer, maybe more verging on middle class areas. Is that right? Or, or... well, uh, you've got to realise that in the mid eighteen hundred odds, thousands of people came over from Ireland mm. as a result of the potato famine, and of course these people had absolutely nothing, no mm. money, virtually nothing. So they inevitably ended up in the the poorest and nastiest and vilest housing which was around the docks. You know, this was, you know, Scotland Road, Dingle and so on. That's where they stayed. There was no way that they were going out there, you know, seven or eight miles to Walton. Were the, with the end of the tram line, and uh, it was a little bit of West Lancashire. People said to me, you know, well, you guys must have had the, the Scouse beaten out of you when, you when you were kids, you know. Mm. And why don't you speak Scouse? And that's because we never spoke Scouse in the first place. My dad's family came over from Ireland in about 1912, I think, and settled in Gattaca, which is you know, just down the road from Walton. Hmm. He was known as Irish Pat when he was at school because he had an Irish accent, hmm. whereas he ended up speaking you know, pretty much like I do, which is Southwest Lanx. Drummer Colin Hanton was born in Bootle. He's never lived anywhere other than Liverpool in his whole life, I don't think. Hmm. And he does not speak with a Scouse accent. We, hmm. we have got a different accent with flat vowels, but it's yeah. not Scouse. And uh, that's because we were a village outside mm. Liverpool on the way to Lancashire. Very different thing these days. Of course, people go there and the trees have had another 50, 60 odd years to, to grow. It's obviously very beautiful and very leafy these days. Yeah. And the main street is a, is a gourmet's paradise. <laughs> mm. That's all we had then was a chip shop, you know? Yeah, I guess my question was going to be like, how, how dangerous was it? I mean, just to um, walk the streets, was it? Well, down the road from where I live, there was a large, what we call a corporation estate. We call, we call them corpy houses, corporation houses. Mm -hmm. And there were quite a few, ultimately, teddy boys who came yep. from there. And they were, you didn't get on the wrong side of them. But, I mean, you, you would go out to play, as we used to say. There was a large, long, grassy bank with loads of bushes and a couple of patches of grass. And we, we just disappeared, you know, came back when we were hungry. I mean, it was completely safe. It's just a yeah. bit later on in our teens, you know, you have to, had to keep, when, when someone invented teddy boys, you have to be mm. uh, just a wee bit careful. Some of the kids that lived in the corporation estate, because obviously we were the quotes, posh, unquotes, kids. Mm. So they would take delight in uh, bashing us up occasionally, but yeah. you know, nothing serious by any means, you know. But there's definitely a huge difference with the Dingle. For those, for those who don't know Liverpool, the Dingle's where uh, Ringo Starr grew up. Also Billy Fury, didn't he? And the, yeah. I, Have you read uh, any of Mark Lewison's Tune In book? I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a monster. The, the commercial version was 900 pages and the special edition was 1,700 pages. It's only maniacs like me that managed to read through. Have you read any of that, of that I've book? I've read them all. Yeah, I've read it all. And the, and the big thick edition. Yes, I have a table with a short leg and they'll fit perfectly. <laughs> no, I have read them, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I found that book fantastic. I, I read it on... Um, it's the only book I've ever read on Kindle. It was the, the 1,700 page. And I read it over three months. And I honestly thought I knew everything about the Beatles. And this book was just, it was a journey, you know. It was incredible. Well, he's fantastic, Mark. Fantastic. Yeah, he is. He is. I have a slight bone to pick with him occasionally because mm. he seems to think that uh, my career with the Quarrymen started later than I maintain. But, uh, you okay. know. Well, let, let me get on to that. Uh, what I was going to say about Ringo is the story of Mark Lewison's book is that, of course, Ringo had to transport his drums everywhere. And basically, yeah. when, he, when he left his house, as it said, as Mark says, he basically he was transporting these drums. As soon as anyone saw him, any of the local gangs, they'd either beat him up or nick his drums. So 
Is that would that be more or less true, or does uh, it sound well, like it? it could well be? Yeah. I mean, our, our drummer Colin carried his bass drum in his left hand mm. and a suitcase with the snare and everything else, all his other bits and pieces in his in, in a suitcase in his right hand. Mm. And we always travelled everywhere by public transport, mm. except once or twice. My dad actually did take us to gigs in the car, mm. very very rarely. You know, so you, you were just travelling on the bus and there was a TTS base under the stairs, you know, mm. it was just normal. Occasionally, the quarry men would get chased by the odd teddy boy, especially when we played in Garston or something like that. Yeah. There are stories of, uh, although I don't remember being there myself, you know, of the other guys leaping on the bus and just leaving the TTS kicking around the road, you know, to escape. I mean, the funny thing is that when I think of that, I mean, I was born in uh, 75, but I always maintain that I was really... My soul is in the in the sixties because <laughs> uh, I grew up in a little town called Egham. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Egham in Surrey. It's near Windsor. It's near. And um, like a, well, one of my closest friends lived in Egham. He's now moved down to Hailing Island, but yes, I do know Egham. In fact, I've even taught mm. in Egham. Do you believe? Of course, it's famous because of Holloway uh, Royal Holloway College, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and, and mm. Magna Carta just down the road. Yeah. Absolutely, and there's even a JFK memorial, and, and Jackie Kennedy came to Egham in 64, the year after the assassination, and uh, I wasn't around then, but uh, and she uh, she was there when they put the, the plaque up. Anyway, what I was going to say was that uh, when I hear these stories of, you know, skiffle and everything, it just makes it all sound very earthy, and there, there definitely was an earthy quality, wasn't it? And I think that was important with the Beatles, wouldn't you say? Uh, well... Uh, Again, it was uh, earthy, earthy, earthy. Sort of meaning very rootsy, starting from nothing, and and it made it different than if you start with privilege. That's what I'm trying to get at. I don't know if that uh, makes sense. Well, I wasn't really conscious of there being a huge... I mean, I, I was sort of probably lower middle class. We, mm. we um, Our house was being bought on a mortgage. My dad had left school at 15. My mm. mother had left school at 15, and, and she, she'd been working in Wilton in an, an overall sewing shop, although she did actually go to grammar school. But with regard to the music, only when rock and roll came along, rock and roll seemed to be very much more a working class phenomenon than skiffle. I mean, even today, when we go back to Liverpool, because I live in London, we get to meet the rock and rollers from the, the late 50s and the early 60s. Mm. And, you know, they still say to us, oh, where, where do you live? Where did, where did you live? And I mm. say, oh, Walton. Uh, then they say, oh, yeah, the posh bit. So there's still traces of the, uh, you know, middle class, working class divide, even today, you know, they, they always say, oh, Walton, the posh bit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there are thousands of people from the really poor areas that have been knocked down and they've been decanted out to the suburbs. Mm. There's still the traces of that. I mean, we were only kids having fun, basically. Yeah. We weren't uh, trying to find a way out of the slums or anything like that, mm. you know. Sometimes the story's better than the reality, though, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> they always say print print the legend instead of the... Oh, yeah, getting getting yeah. back to the, you know, the John Lennon working-class hero bit. People come to Walton, especially Americans, and, mm. and they're looking for dark satanic mills and stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, when they see how beautiful it, it is these days, especially with all the trees growing up, and, and, and Lennon's Auntie Mimi's house is not exactly... Uh, I mean, it was it was a posher house than the, the one I grew up in, mm. and uh, they are somewhat thrown by the uh, contrast between their mental image and the reality. I mean, John's mother, Julia, she did live in a in a corporation house, mm. which was considerably more modest. And Paul's mother, being a nurse, lived out in Speak, and they had uh, they were allocated a house because she needed to be near her patient, and that was again, you know, corporation house, municipal housing. Hmm. And the, where he lived in Falsling Road. George, of course, again, lived in Speak and so on. So John was um, so, socially, or at least where he lived anyway, was socially a cut above the, the rest of the group. So uh, I guess we need to talk about uh, Mr Lennon, since this is a podcast about him. Can you remember the first time you ever saw him or the first time you ever met him? Any memories about that? Well, the actual occasion, I don't remember. But, okay. Uh, Sunday afternoons, my mum used to send us to Sunday school at St Peter's Church, mm. and I must have been going there from when I was quite young, and my mum and dad obviously wanted a quiet Sunday afternoon, and in my Sunday school class was Pete Shotton, who became John's bosom friend, yep. Nigel Wally, 
who was also in John's gang, became the manager of the Quarry Men. Mm -hmm. Ivan Bourne, who introduced John to and Paul. Jeff Rind, who took the famous photograph. Twenty of us, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when John came to live at Aunt Mimi, she presumably also wanted a quiet Sunday afternoon. So mm -hmm. he appeared in our class at Sunday school. I can't mm -hmm. remember when, remember the occasion, but that it, John appeared. And uh, before long, my parents were saying, now you stay away from that Lennon. I think Mimi thought the sun shone out of his various orifices, but <laughs> his parents knew that, that uh, he was the sort of kid that would quite quickly lead your kids astray. Yeah. But, I mean, was he uh, a dangerous kid? Because the thing is, I mean, celebrities get very much elevated, but, again, if, you, if you've read Mark Lewison's book, and anyone who's read it, what I remember, because I was taking notes while I was reading it, because I thought... There's no way I'm going to ever be able to read this book twice, so I better make the most of it when I read it. So I was making notes, and I wrote down that all the adjectives that Mark Lewison used to describe John Lennon, there's so many contradictions. I think that's part of what the fascination is with him. Can you give us a, I don't know, a very broad picture of what he was like? Was he a dangerous guy, or was he just a bit cheeky as a teenager? I think, basically, he didn't give a damn. He realised that at school, apart from... I mean, he was on detention had a lot of detentions a year or so ago the list of his detentions came up oh, right. have you have you seen that no i haven't no no it's worth having a look at i can send you a copy yeah of please it. please yeah but i mean he was mucking about so much he was getting detentions when he was on detention <laughs> we had a system at school which was called the bad mark system and if you did something that uh, displeased one of the teachers you got one bad mark mm. uh, if you got two in the, in the same week, you got an hour's detention. Mm. And I managed one bad mark in my entire career. Mm. I was, a, as I say, a bit of a goody-goody and a bit of a swat. Whereas John and Pete were getting detentions like they were going out of style. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, he just didn't like to conform. And that was the problem, really, that he didn't like authority. He mm. didn't like to conform. This was He was a confounded nuisance at school. Mm. And I've been a teacher not all of my life, but some of my life. And you get John saying, well, I was a genius. People didn't recognize it at school. This is totally untrue. Yeah. Because a lot of the teachers did realize he was a very clever lad. But he was also a very disruptive lad. I, you know, I, if someone had come up to me and said, look, sir, I'm, I'm a genius. I'm going to bugger about in your class mm. and make life difficult for you. I'd have probably clipped him over the ear because you mm. couldn't do it in those days, sent him to the back of the class, said, well, you might be a genius, but I've got 31 idiots here. I'm supposed mm. to educate. Some of the things he did were very funny, and some of them, he was just a complete pain in, in proverbial, you know. Yeah, because um, it's just and, literally one and, example of, of one of his pranks. I mean, what, what, how serious were they? Was it just... Well, this, to... this is a simple one, mm. exactly. A friend I met this week, at one, one occasion, there were two classrooms which had folding doors in between them. He managed to close up the folding doors and trap this lad inside the folding doors. <laughs> so, you know, when the teacher came in, there was this, there's noises coming out of the folding doors, and it was David Simmons trapped behind the doors. But that wasn't particularly brilliant. There was an old English teacher to, to whom John practically gave a a nervous breakdown through, yeah. through messing around. You know, you, you, you couldn't get on with teaching. It was a grammar school. The idea was, mm. the, you know, get on with it. Probably his funniest thing was in the scripture or religious knowledge, should point out, I was never in the same class as John. Mm. I was in the same house, which, of course, house, you have to explain what houses are for people who don't know. Yeah. Um, so I had 15 minutes usually at the beginning of the morning and, and at the end of the day when I was in the same classroom as John, mm. which is when he handed out his, you know, daily howl notebook stuff. Yeah. Um, this is a story from Pete Shotton's book, because mm. Pete was in the same class. And one of them said to the other, our religious teacher, Mr. McDermott, is not going to be happy until he has a whole class of vicars. And uh, <laughs> so Pete's mum had a grocer's shop, and they searched around in the back and found a load of old cereal packets, and they made 32 dog collars. Have you heard this story? Yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. Cardboard. Mm. And they handed them out to the whole class. And when the teacher came in, he didn't look at the class. He just sat down at his desk and started writing something. Mm. And then he looked up, and there he found he had 32 vicars all staring at him, trying not to giggle. And he thought that was just a fantastic joke, which indeed it was. 
uh, that would have done the rounds of the staff room in the next five minutes, and people would say, that, you know, that bloody Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, very funny, but he's a confounded nuisance, you know. Yeah. Basically, uh, he was a disruptive pupil who occasionally had, you know, flashes of brilliance, did things like that, you know. He was a great cartoonist, and That's one right. of the stories which everybody knows is, is the John Lennon dart stall, where he had these fantastic cartoons of teachers. And then I've, I've got some, the, the Daily Express or the Sunday Express, produced a weekend magazine which had some of these illustrations in and they are quite brilliant and the teachers mm. are perfectly recognizable you know he was a very clever guy but he did not want to conform he didn't give a damn about punishment i mean apart from getting the cane occasionally and then he realized that that was all they could do to him and the, yeah. the great punishment of course was to be suspended and they were suspended for two weeks and they didn't even have to go to school at all i mean that was fantastic oh there you go yeah yeah you're reward it's rewarding him in a funny way isn't it i don't think i ever really got on the wrong side of it possibly because we've known each other since we were very young but he could be very unpleasant mm. he didn't do much much fighting Pete Shot was much better. He he actually was quite a good boxer. Pete, when he mm. went to the police cadets, he was quite good boxing. John, possibly uh, he had a very sharp tongue, and he was usually mm. able to use his uh, sharp tongue to get out of trouble. But you know, there you are. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you have any interest in things like psychology? Because what I'm actually trying to do with this podcast, I'm, I don't have any, I don't have any professional credentials of psychology, but I've studied it, and uh, I'm trying to get beyond the facts and get inside the person. And I, I guess maybe John Lennon has been a bit overanalyzed over the years. Maybe, do you think the truth was maybe a bit simpler than people think? Or? Well, an awful lot of Beatles stuff has been overanalyzed. Right, over yeah, years, yeah. Especially lyrics. Yes. So yes. Uh, maybe the answer is a little bit simpler. I mean, mm. one of Pete Shotton's stories was that he was round at John's one day, John's house one day, not uh, when the Beatles were famous, and John was in the process of writing I'm the Walrus. We were on a, a Q&A in America, and one of the guys on the, on the Q&A was a, a man who probably made his career out of interpreting Beatles lyrics. Mm. And uh, Pete came up with this story, he said there were all these sacks in John's from Hall, and I asked him what they were, and <coughs> he said, oh, they're fan letters. Are you going to bother answering them then? Says Pete, no, I, I'm not going to bother, says John, because there'll be another five sacks full tomorrow and the next day. I just throw them away. To cut the long story short, John said to me, look, you know, they were, you can have a look at them if you wish, you know. So Pete thought he might find a few revealing posters, uh, pictures of young ladies in mm. mail. Anyway, he said he found a letter from a lad from Corey Bank who'd been asked to interpret John's lyrics and John said, look, they are. I told them I was a genius at school, and now they didn't believe me, and now they're setting my lyrics in English classes. He said to Pete, what was that song we used to sing in the playground about custard and dogs? Pete said, yellow matter custard, grease slop pie, yeah. all mixed up with a dead dog's eye, spread it on the sarnie nice and thick, and wash it down with a cup of cold sick. And as he was writing Iron the Walrus, he wrote that into the lyrics, and he said, let the bastard work out what that means. You know, basically... A lot of the stuff that he wrote was not as deep as people had mm. subsequently researched, you know. Mm. I mean, a gentleman on the, on the Q&A who had spent his life doing this, his mouth opened and closed and no sound came out. I mean, my own theory about it is that it's probably, it probably wasn't being crafted with uh, any sort of subliminal thing, but I think the subliminals come out. And I think when people do take to a song, I mean, something like Imagine is obvious because the lyrics are very clear. Yes. But something like I Am The Walrus, my own, this is only my theory, is that, that people do hear something in it beyond those lyrics. I mean, that's, that's very difficult to ascertain, isn't it? But that, that's my feeling that there is something subliminal. But uh... Well, I mean, you've also got to remember that um, they were also trying to fill up LPs. <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah. You know, so inevitably some of the stuff that uh, they they churned out it's got to be more well I, I use the word churned out I mean I can't write rings of stuff like they do mm. but uh, inevitably some of it is going to be weaker than the uh, the high spots mm. and uh, some of it has got to be journeyman stuff I expect you know you've got to write an awful lot of songs before you start producing good stuff you know there are quite a few Beatles songs which uh, could be said they're fillers you know mm. Mm. not every word is a gem you know yeah Let's go back a little bit to the quarrymen. So can you tell us a little bit about your, where would you rehearse and 
what material can you remember specifically playing? Well, to man? go back to the genesis of the quarry man, okay. really, it was rock iron and lime which did it. And if you talk to any of the you know late fifties, early sixties rock and rollers, they should, and most of them do, give credit to Lonnie Donigan and Rock Island Line as the song that got them going. So I was fourteen in Quarry Bank, mm -hmm. and my mum and dad they'd like to go to St Helens Market, which was about ten miles outside Liverpool, mm -hmm. and it was on a Saturday afternoon, and I was sitting in the back of my dad's car. Well, people in our end of the woods did actually have cars mm -hmm. from about 1952, 53 onwards. And uh, the sound of Lonnie Donegan came singing Rock Island Line came wafting out of this record shop. Mm -hmm. And such a contrast with the rest of the music we'd been hearing, mm -hmm. it absolutely smacked me right between the eyes. And I never really recovered from it. It completely yeah. changed my life, as indeed it did with thousands of other youngsters. So... I badgered my mum and dad to get me a guitar or a banjo. We had violins at home, but that, you can't really strum them. I mm. had a battered ukulele, that was no use. And uh, we discovered that an uncle of mine who played in a, a dance band in North Wales played violin and saw, doubled on the musical saw, which my brother still has and still plays. His brother-in-law was the banjo stroke guitar player in this band. And the band had given up some time ago. So the uncle, the, the brother-in-law, had uh, decided to cash in on the skittle boom and sell his instruments. Mm. By the time we discovered this, he'd already sold the guitar, to my eternal regret. Mm. As if they had the guitar, then maybe the Beatles would, might never have happened. I got the banjo, which didn't bother me because Donegan played banjo and guitar. Although, in fact, he played guitar chords on banjo. Mm. I know I've spoken to him personally about it. So I appeared, it must have been on a Sunday, we'd gone over to North Wales to get this banjo for five pounds. And I turned up at school the next morning and said to my friend Eric Griffiths, who was uh, in the same house as me, same yeah. year as me, I got a banjo yesterday, Eric. Oh, he said, do you want to be in a group? So I said, well, who's in this group? So he said himself on guitar, Pete Shot on the washboard, a lad called Bill Smith on the tea chest and John Lennon himself on guitar. So they were all friends of mine in the same year at Quarry Bank. So I said, yeah, well, that sounds great. So that's how I got in. They knew I hadn't, I couldn't play it because I'd only bought it the day before. Mm. But uh, they were playing banjo chords. And uh, if you play in the key of G, you don't even have to put your fingers on at all because the banjo is tuned to an open G chord. And it was a two-finger chord for C and a two-finger chord for D7. So it wasn't mm. exactly pocket sign. Obviously, they've uh, been playing for some time before I joined them, because I seem to remember they, they had quite a few charts, they could play quite a few songs. Mm. And Eric shouted to me, the time to change the chords. And uh, I very soon picked it up by ear. Uh, I then got a, I bought a banjo tutor and started playing chord inversions up the neck. And Lennon said, hey, you play down there the same as everybody else. He didn't want to be shown up by a banjo player. Mm. Because, you know, he's playing anything above it. You know, the first three frets was, was absolutely really cool. He didn't want that happening. So we just pillaged uh, Lonnie Donigan's repertoire shamelessly, as did everybody else. And people these days rather sneeringly say, oh, you only play covers. Well, almost nobody wrote their own stuff in those days anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. nobody went up to Frank Sinatra and said, you, know, you only play covers. <laughs> They've got a bunch of fives. You know? Or Bing Crosby, yeah. Or Elvis. <laughs> Absolutely. They do say that very sneeringly to us, mm. even now. Oh, you only played covers, mm. smack in the face. And then, of course, other people came along, like Bob Court Skiffle Group with um, Worried Man Blues. I had to have a couple of old 78s of Burl Ives at home, one of which was Worried Man Blues. So we got the word for worried, words for Worried Man Blues off that. Uh, there was um, Chas McDevitt and Freight Train. That caused chaos because... There was a fourth chord in Freight Train, and uh, we all were running around like headless chickens trying to find out what the hell chord he was playing. Yeah, so that's what we were trying to do, just endure ourselves, sound as much as we could, like the records, and obviously failing miserably, being up on stage, trying to impress the young ladies and having fun, basically, and there was nothing more than that. And I guess John was clearly the leader. I mean, some people have said he was a very generous, very loyal, and others, say, others would say he had a big ego. So what... What kind of leader was he, was it? Uh, well, he had the best voice, basically. Okay. And 
whenever we played, there was only ever one microphone. Obviously, there wasn't a microphone at all. And as he was the lead singer, the rest of us would just join in the chorus. There was no attempt mm. at harpies or anything like that. But it, it was uh, definitely his group. He didn't dominate the rest of us or anything like that, you know. Okay. There was no problem. If he didn't like a song, he wouldn't sing it. But that was fair enough because he would have been the lead singer. So, you know, he's, he's unlikely to sing something he didn't like. Even if the rest of us particularly like the song, you can't expect the lead singer to sing stuff he doesn't want to sing. Not long after I joined, the teacher's bass player drifted out for various reasons, mm. and we got the first of first member of Liverpool Institute in. Well, that's I jokingly say that's when the quarrymen started going downhill when we got people in from Liverpool Institute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gary on the teacher's bass, and our friend Colin Hanson. I, I'd known mm. Colin since I was a kid because he used to play street football in his street. It was a cul-de-sac, so it was very safe. Colin came in on drums about the same time as Len. So we mm. had a drummer, a washboard player, a teacher's bass player, two guitars, and a, and a banjo, all being thrashed like mad. Mm. And uh, inevitably, you know, we were drowning out the singers. So Colin was always told, for God's sake, play with your brushes. You know, you're drowning us out. That was the setup, really. It, yeah. was, it was absolutely, totally amateurish. John and Eric played banjo chords on the guitar yeah 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 the reason for that was they someone had found an advert probably eric had found an advert in the local shop offering guitar lessons from the man in hunts cross which is the next village and mm. Walton. Mm. and uh, they went there and i think they had a couple of lessons but this chap wanted to teach them to read music and all they needed was a couple of chords basically so they realized this was going to take forever and complaining to John's mother, Julia, she said, well, if you tune your banjo, your guitars, rather, like mm. banjos, mm. the banjo chords I know and can teach you will work. And that mm. is indeed what they did. They tuned the guitars to an open chord. Now, these days, open tuning you know, has been quite cool for a long time. Yeah. It's vicious of open tuning, to be honest. But there you go. And they, they tuned the top four strings, uh, well, they took the whole thing to a G chord, basically. Mm. Uh, never fingered the bottom two strings and three banjo chords worked perfectly until Paul McCartney came along and uh, which was after my time and of course he mm. uh, on his influence they started playing proper guitar chords and what about um here's a myth that you might be able to smash what about this thing about rehearsing in the bathroom do you, do you ever remember that that is not a myth no that is oh that's not. true okay okay yeah because if you've ever tried playing and singing in a bathroom at least half tiled you know it's the nearest you get to playing an echo chamber. So John's mother, Julia, would let us, when we practiced at her house, let us, let us uh, play in the, in the bathroom mm. because you could hear yourself sing and play so much better in, in the bathroom than you could in the normal room because the acoustics were totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So that's true. That's not a myth. John's sister, half-sister, Julia, she remembers her and her little sister, Jackie, actually being in the bath, having a bath. And then mum said, come on out, you get you to the corny men want to practice in the bathroom. So wow. they actually had to go and go off to bed and get out of the bathroom. Oh, that's great. Did you see the recent Paul McCartney carpool karaoke? Uh, no, I didn't. I haven't seen it. Um, for some reason, I was busy at the time it came out and I still haven't caught up with it. Yeah, it's on It's on YouTube, but I mean, it's amazing because uh, he goes into 24th and Road apparently for the first time in 54 years. Which is very bizarre, and he immediately uh, immediately goes into the bathroom and starts talking about that. He's like, going, uh, "Everything sounds better in here," and he's showing really, the echo. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, I never played with Paul, but right. we'd already got this habit of practicing in the bathroom before he joined the group. You know. Ah, uh, okay. Let's um, talk about some gigs. So, that, was the first one Rosebury Street? Is that true? Is that... No, no. Um, oh, it wasn't. Okay. John said that, but then again, he would spent a lifetime on sex, drugs and rock and roll. Yeah. He didn't have a life of sex, drugs and rock and roll, I can remember more clearly. Right. Now, our first gigs, we still don't know exactly what they were, mm. but I think Rosebury Street was my next to last gig with the Quarrymen. Okay. It must have been, we played at St Peter's Youth Club, I think, was probably the first gigs we did. They, um, they weren't paid. We're still not, not sure, entirely sure when the Quarrymen started, but... Okay. Um, Colin Hanton was a few years older than the rest of us. He'd already left school. Um, he wasn't at Quarry Bank. And he was, was an apprentice upholsterer, so he could afford the instalment payments on his drum kit. Mm. Colin 
in December 56 was 18. He's just turned 80 in December 2018. Oh, wow. And uh, Colin said that John Lennon was at his birthday party, his 18th birthday party in December 1956. Hmm. And... Uh, he didn't know John until Colin joined the Quarrymen as a drummer. So quite clearly, from Colin's recollection, John must have been a member of the Quarrymen by December 56. Mm. Yeah? Uh, Colin must have been a member of the Quarrymen by December 56, and therefore the band must have been going, or the group as we always called it, we never called it a band, yeah. must have been going before then. We played at some Quarry Bank school dances, and uh, there was a certainly Quarry Bank school dance in November 56. If you're organising a school dance and someone had started the skiffle group the week before, you're not going to offer them the interval spot at your dance, are you? No, I know. So the assumption, therefore, has got to be that it started certainly sometime before November 56 because mm -hmm. the group must have actually been okay, not good enough, shall we say, yeah. to be put on as the interval group at a school dance. So we're now edging our way towards October, September 56, yeah? Okay. And we were inspired by Lonnie Donegan. Now, Rock Island Line hit the charts in January 56, right? Mm. How long do you wait to be inspired to start the group? From January to November? Probably about half an hour, I would say. I, I don't think so. <laughs> um, and there's another guy, Mike Hill, you probably heard the story, went to Amsterdam with the Quarry Bank school trip what the little richard lp uh, the, the, the little richard 78 rather yep. in, in april and he played it to john and that again was an influential moment in john's life so mm. we just haven't been able to come up with any proof i'm afraid right if okay. i could find my dad used to have a black book in which he wrote down his petrol consumption and work, <laughs> uh, wrote down his petrol and his mileage and he used to work out his consumption yeah. and if i could only find that it would have the trip to North Wales in for buying the banjo, and I'd know when I started playing with the quarry men. But mm. We've never thrown it out, but we can't find it. It's out there but somewhere. That would, be, that would be certainly solid, definitive proof, you know. Mm. That, that, and the group had been going before I joined. So, anyway, so um, there we go. Rosebury Street was definitely not the first. Nigel Wally had left school at 14 and obviously he left school in July 56 let me get this right yeah in July 56 and then become an apprentice to the golf professional at Lee Park Golf Club mm -hmm. and as it happened there was a, a well-known Liverpool doctor called Dr Sittner who was a member and Nigel occasionally had to play golf with him and you know help him as, as you know whatever clean his clubs or whatever mm. and Dr Sittner's son Alan Sittner was the man who started the, the cavern and yeah. the cavern opened in January 57 January the 19th 57 and um, Nigel wanted the quarry men to, have to get a booking at the cavern so Alan Sittner the younger the son of Dr Sittner said well yeah but I want to hear you guys first so we got this gig at the golf club and uh, as a result of that we then got some bookings at the cavern that's a bit of a problem because there's a book called the best of sellers and in it they have transcribed every single echo advert for the cavern uh, right the way through the years now the echo adverts were about one centimeter tall and about three or four centimeters long so yeah. you're not going to get a lot of information in that so they basically only the headliner band's names or the headliner group's names appeared in those adverts. Mm -hmm. Now the first one which the Quarrymen are named in is, is I think it's 6th, 7th or 8th of August, 57. Yep. I'm, I'm into this naval fluff stuff, you asked me, asked me if I remembered anything. That was the first one which had the Quarrymen's name in it. Now the Quarrymen weren't suddenly going to appear and be a named group. Right in mm. that little tiny advert, I think there were only two groups named in the advert. We had to have established ourselves some kind of reputation at the cabin for them to actually not not exactly headlining us, but at least we yeah. were in the advert. And our point is that we had played, or well, my point is that we played a number of times, probably three or four times. They had sort of skiffle evenings with quote special guests unquote, 
and uh, that was what we were on. I, I distinctly remember playing on the same evening as the uh, the swing in blue jeans, for instance, the blue jeans skiffle group originally. It's very difficult when you look at Paul and uh, think about Paul and uh, and John. In fact, only yesterday I was listening to a podcast by David Bedford, and he actually says, funnily enough. The worst sources of information are John and Paul. You don't actually remember, and I, I put it down to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll as I did. Yeah. Well, I think I think when the Beatles made the anthology, they also kind of decided on a version because it was going to get too complicated if their memories didn't concur. So <clears throat> I think that's what happens really. They you decide on a version that becomes the standard version, I guess. True. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. Um, <coughs> the, you know the, there are holes in it, like. You can drive a double decker bus through. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. When you, when you, if you start, if you talk about the the moment John and Paul met, kind of thing, there's, mm. there's a double decker bus there that can go right the way through the middle of that. We can talk about that later. If you... Well, in fact, we're going to come on to that now. So um, let's talk about this famous day, sixth of July, nineteen fifty-seven. Um, so it was Wilton Village Fate. Now I'm going to be ostentatious and imagine that some American listeners might be listening to me. Uh, what would that be? A garden party? It's a garden party, basically, isn't it? Um, well, it depends what you mean by garden party. Right. Okay. I mean, this was there were two major events in Wilton every year. One was bonfire night, and mm. the other one was St Peter's. It was the we call it the Rose Queen, right? Okay. Even though it says Wilton Garden, you know, village fate or whatever, mm. we call it Rose Queen because some young lady was crowned the Rose Queen, like Miss Wilton, yeah. almost. Um, well, uh, <laughs> people seem to think it was a beauty contest. No, it wasn't a beauty contest. You know, and, and, you know, in their mind's eye, they've got young ladies parading up and down in minimal bathing costumes. No, I don't mm. know whether she was chosen for her virtue or her good looks. I don't know why she was chosen. Yeah. But it started off with a, a parade around the village, usually led by a military band of some kind. There was, mm. Sometimes it was the Scottish Liverpool uh, sea Forth Highlanders. Uh, mm. Sometimes it was in '57. It was the um, the Glasgow, uh, not the Glasgow Yeomanry. Sorry, the Cheshire Yeomanry. Yep. Um, and then you'd have a Scouts bugle band. There'd be a number of lorries, uh, kindly loaned by local merchants. Everything from coal merchants to vegetable merchants. And there'd be various mm. tableau on these lorries. Mm. Um, there'd be the retiring Rose Queen with her retinue and the, mm. the incoming Rose Queen. And uh, there were two routes. One would go down the hill, down King's Drive, where I live, and back, and then, you know, round various streets. And then the other one, the other route would go round the top of the hill. And they alternated each year with these. Mm. So there was a procession started, you know, early afternoon, maybe one or something like that. Mm. came back up to the church and then everybody would get off the lorries and go into the field behind the church where there was a permanent stage and um, famous photograph jeff ryan's photograph people keep insisting it's it's a, on the back of a lorry no we right. just spent uh, three quarters of an hour on the back of a lorry and my mm. dad has some photographs that was on that lorry it was a permanent stage in some pieces it was faced with lumps of sort of breeze block which you can still see on the front garden walls in Wilton, if you if you know worth a look, mm. the program there was a judging of the fancy dress for kids. The Rose mm. Queen was being crowned by some local lady. Uh, there was selections being played by the band of the Cheshire Yeomanry. There was a, mm. a police pub display, and somewhere buried in that lot was the quarrymen. And uh, that was what happened. Basically, there were there were mm. little stalls around the field selling cakes and drinks and. Mm. The scouts had a not a zip wire, but a so, sort of a British boy slide and things. It was it was a whole lot of fun, and we were performing, you know, in front of our grannies and, and aunts and stuff like that. You know, so for us, it, it was quite a big deal. And that's where we're going to leave it for part one of my talk with Rod Davis. Um, I've cut it off about halfway through the interview, roughly, and uh, quite a good moment actually, because we're just starting to talk about the Wilton Village fate which uh, to uh, non-Beatles or casuals Beatles fans uh, might not seem much of a big deal but I think to real to Beatles uh, aficionados uh, 6th of July 1957 uh, Wilton Village fate uh, carries a great deal of significance uh, it's obviously the day that John Lennon first met Paul McCartney or at least made proper contact with him there is a rumour 
uh, or a theory that they actually met at a newsagent. And uh, you'll never guess what the newsagent is called. Apparently it's called ABBA in uh, Liverpool. Uh, one of many uh, bizarre coincidences, if that one's true. ABBA, of course, were, I guess you might say, a 70s version of the Beatles. Not not necessarily that similar in style, but writing these incredibly catchy songs, doing what the Beatles did initially, just crafting these songs which were impossible not to, not to like, at least, or, or to at least uh, respond to, let's say. So, yeah, that's all I'm going to say, really. Uh... So next week we'll be um, back with the second half of Rod's interview. And uh, there were a couple of things, in fact. Just to say that if you haven't visited the Facebook page, uh, it's called Glass Onion, colon, on John Lennon. Um, so please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Um, and the email address, uh, you will find it in the description of this audio, which is on... Uh, if you're listening in... Uh, February, as it's being done, it's on SoundCloud. Hopefully at some point in the future, people will be listening to it on iTunes when the website's up and running and I've got my iTunes feed happening. But anyway, the email address, if you want to give some feedback, is uh, anthony, without an H, at glassonionjlpod.com. And I do have a request, in fact. I would like to do a listener questions episode so if you do have any questions about John Lennon, um, I will take any questions and consider them. But, you know, maybe something perhaps psychological or something with a bit of depth to it so I can uh, give you a, a full answer. Other things, of course, you know, certain facts you can find out in um, many Beatles books. Although <laughs> you'll find, in fact, that Rod Davis uh, will be debunking quite a few of the ones about uh, the Walton Village fate, but that's another story. So, yeah, I would welcome uh, questions about John Lennon. And uh, so that's it. So you can probably hear the outro music coming up. And I'll see you next Friday for the second part of the Rod Davis interview. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.